Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Marsha Sheehan. I'm the chapter, uh, president of the uh, Golden Gate chapter, and uh, thrilled to be here tonight to kick off our Summer of E-Learning series of tonight's you know fabulous panel discussion. And our panelists, thank you very much for volunteering and, and being here. And you know, the iPad prize, you know, awesome. Um, and uh, we have a. Uh, complete program throughout the summer of a number of events that are on the uh, e-learning topic. Um, and if you're a member of our chapter, you can still reap a lot of discounts if you want to go to a lot more of these programs. The more you register for, the more you save. So um, it's, it's a real, um, going to be a fabulous series and uh, I hope to see many of you at the rest of our events. And thank you for coming tonight. Thanks. And you can actually save more than your membership costs by signing up. Yeah, so there's savings. I did, I did, I did the back of an envelope calculation today. There's $135 worth of savings to be had for a member over a non member uh, over the, the various events we've got. And I'd like to talk about some of those events before I introduce our phenomenal panel. Um, so, uh, a week, uh, well, a couple of weeks from now, on the 10th, I believe, back back on normal Wednesday, uh, we on the 10th of July, we have uh, Dave Ashkind from Train by Cell, who will be talking about how you can create, how you can implement mobile learning in your organization. So talking about the, the strategy you need to think about before you do it, and then also some hands-on, let's get the hands dirty and do some of that and create some mobile learning. Um, that's July. Uh, then we go into August, uh, and I'm proud to be able to say that we, we welcome the first of our uh, e-learning heroes uh, the, to, to the chapter, and that's Tom Coleman, uh, who's doing two workshops for us. Uh, the first of those is the, uh, the Power of Rapid E-Learning. Uh, sorry, How to Become a Rapid E-Learning Pro is a full, full day workshop, I think, on the 13th of August. Um, the followed by a one day articulate storyline uh, workshop on the 14th and that evening he's coming along and doing a workshop for those who can't make the uh, one to extend um, which is the power of rapid e-learning uh, those of you who don't know tom he's the uh, community manager for articulate um, who is we'll come hear about today is one of the, which is one of the, um, the, the significant players in terms of the e-learning development tools and then, oh, what's, what's the month after that? Ah, oh, the month after that, e-learning Joe comes back. Um, so, um, in order to balance out, and so we're not, we're not particularly in favor of one tool or the other, uh, I'm not gonna refer to him as e-learning Joe for that one, he'd be Captivate Joe for that one, uh, one of his various titles. Uh, so Joe is gonna be back with us to do a full day workshop on getting started with Captivate. I and will be both articulate and I will uh, also captivate <laughs> He says modestly. Yes, very modestly. I will captivate you with my articulosity. And then, um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's something to look forward to. And then in the evening, um, with, uh, with, we know what's coming around the next, the next thing on the corner, around the corner is HTML5, something else on our plates. Uh, and Joe will be doing an evening workshop on what you as e learning developers need to know about HTML5. And that is our summer some of your learning, and I'm just so thrilled that it's coming together. I'm so looking forward to seeing so many of you at so many of those sessions. But first of all, tonight, I am pleased and proud to be able to welcome to Golden Gate Chapter uh, four leaders from across the country, and hopefully, uh, oh, I see Craig seem to be connected, so hello Craig. Um, so four leaders across the country, both here and in, on the internet, um, to our panel. I'm going to start, um, I'm start with this. Uh, so let's, start with, let's start with Captivate Joe, e-learning Joe, 20 something plus years, 30 something plus years, working with e-learning technology, uh, one of the gurus of the industry. Uh, we're very, you know, everyone's uh, names and stuff are going on. I have to do this, I can do this in time with what's going on. Uh, and what's more, most recently, uh, this year, he was uh, awarded the Guildmaster uh, title from the e-learning guild. There's only one other person who's ever had that title 
And that's all quick. Next day, next day. Until yesterday. Somebody else got that yesterday? Yes, Alice was got it yesterday. I didn't know that it had got it here. Hart literally wrote the book on designing and learning. It's called Designing and Learning. Um, and you know, again, a huge amount of experience. Um, and if you, I've been following him on, on Twitter as a Quinovator for a while. Um, one of the people who I'm so, so pleased to be able to work with him. Um, Michelle Lentz, um, glad to see she's, she's here in our local, uh, uh, local, now local to our Golden uh, Gate area. Uh, 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 Michelle uh, Gordon has got 20 years of experience uh, in the e-learning world. Uh, uh, now works with Oracle as an e-learning More importantly, she went to Oracle. And I want to talk about that. So, uh, 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 Michelle. Uh, Randall is the strategic leader for digital learning. And I hope you can find out exactly what that means. Uh, also, well done for that for coming to our chapter. Um, we still went on. Nick, Nick Warren Nick is the president of Sealworks, uh, and very generously, Sealworks are donating tonight's uh, prize, which is that iPad Mini. If your name's not in the hat, it needs to be. Actually, don't worry about that. The fewer names, the better. I need an iPad. Uh, and those of you hoping to see uh, uh, Scott Abel, uh, the uh, content wrangler, sadly Scott was not able to be with us, uh, he has a family medical issue, but stepping up to the group as our uh, extra member of the panel, who was kind of there when he was waiting, I was trying to decide, do I, do I just go for the panel of eight? Or do I stick them the main So we have yeah, Phil. Yeah, yeah, Phil's been doing this for a long time as well. Yeah. 29 years. So uh, I was to do the math, I ran out of figures to work out how many years of experience we've got. Uh, 8 billion. Um, so that's a lot of experience. Uh, Phil's going for, uh, Phil is the designer's coordinator of mobile applica application development for Canada College. Explain what that means. Now, also, with us, hopefully, I'm going to try and connect. Aha! I see, I see Craig. So I can download an Adobe app and use it in the video things I can download it on your new device, go quickly, and I can open my files from Dropbox or whatever, and I can work on it. So the way I came into it was not the big transformation is how software is going to be used and distributed and how we're all going to be accessing it. Craig, any thoughts? Um, it's difficult. Can you? Uh, just quickly say what the question is. I'm getting some feedback. Sure. Well, we started with a general question about where do we think that tools are going in even one year from now? Because uh, things are moving very quickly in the tool industry, and we've had a few different time periods. Yeah, I can hear people's responses. Okay. Hear people's responses. Okay. This is related to just to make sure, and please excuse them from getting over sort of a bad cold. Um, this is related to. Uh, where Love in a year from back. now is going to be happening with uh, authoring tools? Shop where are the possibilities from a business standpoint? Yes. Okay, just to make sure. Um, I th you know, I, my personal feeling is one of the biggest plays that's going to happen, you know, from a business standpoint, the technology advances um, on the authoring tool side. I think Tin Can API offers an enormous capability. There is also there's an, an authoring tool vendor out there today that is actually um, enables you to create a course within your Xbox 360 because it uses the latest version of Windows and their SaaS-based platform. And I believe, you know, what this is going to do is really take uh, people who have the ability um, to, you know, do not want to create courses for whatever reason within their business, they can go ahead and do it outside. I also believe that two major impacts are going to happen in, in the authoring tool space. One is going to be uh, augmented reality, which is already taking place. It was taking place two years ago. Uh, more and more vendors, I think, are adapting to it from a business standpoint. It offers a lot of uh, capabilities, but its challenge is it is not really geared towards, say, the rapid uh, content course authoring tool market. and 
you know, they, there is a possibility that one of the biggest challenges is that on the business side is people who are e-learning developers and instructional designers not really having those capabilities. So I think AR offers, offers that. And the second piece is Connect Technology, which isn't, wasn't created by Microsoft. It was created in Cambridge, England. And um, it offers really an enormous potential and possibility um, that can I impact and benefit anybody who's creating, you know, within the authoring tools um, on the business side, right from your, your workplace computer. That, that, that is, uh, those, those are really interesting comments. Uh, the whole idea of augmented reality being uh, having that apply to our industry. Uh, I find that a very exciting idea. Um, Belting, what's the question? <laughs> yeah. uh, a couple of things, uh, thoughts I had was, uh, uh, you all remember the thing called QR codes? Yeah. How quickly is that being adopted? And that's uh, very old. I think augmented reality is a really good thing. There are some good applications for it, but I think it will be slow to be adopted. And I think there will be a new technology coming out place that will actually displace augmented reality. We're doing some experiments right now with augmented reality, but we're also keeping our eye on the program and the 3D uh, screen on, on the mobile bike. So we're looking at that as a new technology coming down the road, but augmented reality I don't think is going to take off the way Google. It will take off the same way as code. It will be used, but not have a penetration uh, that we, we would hope for. It. Okay, it's just a uh, thought on that. Um, what my other thought was? I'd like to follow on. I actually, I think there are architectures to let us do AR, but I think the more interesting thing, the other AR that's going to be interesting is alternate reality. In terms of creating simulations that instead you play at your desktop that are distributed across your work the same way you'll be working, I think that's going to be more likely to be possible sooner. Where it starts distributing on your mobile and it's being spread over time. There are your examples. There's an entire flood management simulation you can play just through Twitter, because that's what would actually you'd be getting the messages from the French government where it happened. So I think, to me, that's the more plausible and very interesting uh, formal learning opportunity. I think augmented reality is really more performance support, but there we start getting into it. Historically, any new technology takes 20 years. This was not 2007. They've been working on this for quite a while. So it takes 20 years. I don't know how old in reality is, but it's, it's been around for a while. There's been different ways of playing with it. But I think within a year, I'm not so sure. But if you look at what Corning is doing in glass, that's where you really might want to focus, because they're making transportable user interfaces where you'll be able to lay glass like on a car dashboard an interface from, say, your iPhone to that. That's at least six to ten years. But for a couple of years, I don't know. I mean, as we move to the cloud, it seems like a lot of our focus is going to be on the shift to that. Timeline note for me, I just, I, just, I was full on mine. You, you were really either one, one or the other. other. You know, you know, it was rare, rare to see the two. I mean, you made your transition because you went to a far and you don't have to pay all that and tools in between. Storyline, story because it kind of integrates a little bit of, of all of that. You know, it's almost a mashup of all these, these different things. But as a tools person, I got kind of, I don't know, my brain just formulated around the pro A tool like Aquaware was the greatest tool, I think, for what we do. Because it made sense, it was logical, and it used the flow of how you wanted the content to, to display. I've yet to find a tool that really was, that, that's been as good as that, and I don't know why it went away. Other than I know when they were doing the web player, it kind of got out of control at that point. Well, I know but exactly it is why it went away. If you buy me a bourbon, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. um, it's just frustrating to have to be like, when you look at a job description for an instructional designer now, it is ridiculous the list of bullets of what you got to know. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know what happened. I think we're in the dark ages. Training right now because yeah. it, Edward Edward Tufte said it all. I mean, PowerPoint's the worst thing ever posted on the earth. Because what, happened, because what happened was 
we lost the ability to do so much, and then we had to become these quote rapid developers, where one one person has to know all of these. Th I used to have a team of, I had a 3D animator, I had a graphic artist, I had an audio person, I had a uh, an a, a renderer, and now I don't have any budget, and I have to do it all. That's why we've proliferated these click next. Well, that's exactly where I wanted to go next. In fact, yeah. because there are. These are the dark ages, I think. Um, by the way, I don't know if you worked at Smart Builder. And so yes. it, you have, it doesn't seem to be close enough to off where I'm. Yeah, I like it. I mean, OK, this, just as a, a aside, I thought that it had more power than some of these tools that was up there with them. But I'm willing to be wrong. And uh, But I think you're right. I think we've gone away from tools that have power. I'm actually hoping Zebra's apps. I think I, I like that shift to an object-oriented metaphor, having come out of programming in strange, twisted parts of my life, um, where we Did you even know what Zebra's app is? Uh, Alan, in, uh, in fact, Michael Allen, who created Authorware at, at Allen Interactions, is now creating Zebra's apps as a cloud-based environment for developing e-learning. But it's Instead of being a page-based or screen-based, it's a object-based, and so objects have properties and they connect to one another and do things. Although somebody told me connect, managing the connections is going to get start getting complex when you do big yeah. things, which would yeah. be a problem. Right. But at some point, if you're doing something complex enough, I really I have this diagram I use sometimes. It talks about complexity, and you want power and ease of use, and yeah. there's just there's nothing that's can inherently can't be powerful and easy to use. And at some point, you cross over to a programming language. Right. And that's why, to me, Flash, as a development environment, instead of as a, a delivery environment, is still probably the lowest hanging fruit that gets you over that barrier. Yeah. And, and the, comple the complexity of scales is, is going with us because we're all looking at different types of delivery modalities for our content. Like, I've been looking at iBooks author for eBooks, you know, and I've been looking at Hype which is a tool for HTML5. And it's, it gets a little dizzying after a while when you think of like, well, you know, these are what we need to, these are probably the modalities we need to support and the operating systems we need to support, that kind of thing. And then it's like, well, what do you, how do you get a content strategy wrapped around that? And I think you have to move back from the tools and figure out, can I single source? Do I have to optimize for different deliveries? And do I have to have seven different tools in the, Mm -hmm. Tool belt, you know what do I? What can I do with with all of these new ways to support learning? You know, and I do want to go to that next. I think Craig, you have something to add? I do. Um, you know, it's interesting that the uh, I used to be a corporate training director, and I get from articles from the Fortune 100 company to quite a few startups. And then in cases of, of some companies I came into, I had to overhaul the entire training program and your tools destroy it and build it from around up. Which which meant I, I had one person from one company where I had to up everybody. I mean it was pretty brutal. And, and uh, as a result I became a jack of all trades. I didn't come with any instructional design background. So, so I remember, I remember I author where and I wanted to kill somebody. Um, because it was so impossible to figure out. Here I come with this, you know, this whole training, uh, you know, I, I, I came from another experience to go into training. I couldn't figure this thing out for the life of me. I did. And then you had to use Macromedia Director, and it just doubled on. And um, when you fast forward to today's offering tool market, the, you know, the, the reason the RCAT, which is Rapid Course Offering Tool Market, has exploded is because there's people that do not have tech skill sets that can come in and create the courses. Um, you know, the, there's great things about PowerPoint. The biggest negative, the negative about, about PowerPoint, in my opinion, that always really frustrates me is people think they, think they can just take a PowerPoint, and stick it online, convert it to flash, and it's a course. Or they have a course that has a lot of text and, and, text and, and some photos. photos. And it really does a disservice to the learner because, because if that's all they see, they just they don't, they don't like, like what they're training. And, and uh, so they get a layer. Now what's taking place is that the authoring to space space is sort of like a light bulb that's going on. And so, and so, so what they're offering is they're now including objects and triggers and actions and a variety of different things so that you can have a product that's very easy to use or you can make it very, you know, very complex. And that includes, you know, um, from my opinion, I track 180 rapid course offering tools. 
and, uh, and uh, the market continues to grow. And what always amazes me is 95% are still SaaS uh, desktop. Even though we've become an economy, uh, a population that is constantly on the go, and there are people that like the, the possibility of creating a course, going offline, and recreating it. And that's where I think uh, that's part of the reason I think Team Can API and a native app offers a lot of flexibility. That said, if you look at the offering to space as a whole, you're going to start seeing trends. And the trends include these avatars and actors that have been around forever. And here they are coming into this. You have these backgrounds and templates that everybody wants this. Collaboration. You know, the new big thing is that HTML5. Well, a year and a half, there was one better already doing it, and now you're starting to see more and more come in. So what you're taking place, what you're taking here, place that here is that anybody can create a course if you, you want to, is what it comes down to. And I think the biggest challenge on the business side that e-learning people face is that and no fault. I mean, I get the whole blend learning approach. I was a huge fan of that for a long time. But they're coming in with an ILT, instructor led training, the background. They've never done e-learning. They've never done web-based. They go into these tools, and they create these courses, and they follow a linear methodology just as if they were in classroom. And the whole point about creating courses that are the most effective, which is the premise of web-based training, is that you can bounce anywhere you want to as often as you want, as many times as you want. And I always use this as a great example. If you go to Microsoft Excel, why should I have to start already and open a file? I already know that. I'd rather go and just create a macro or whatever it could be. And the WBT, the authoring tools today, um, you know, they see video, for example. People see that as a screen recording. Uh, and so the terminology kind of takes place, and there's only a few products that are what I consider true sims. But no matter what it comes down to, no matter what it comes down to, is you can have the greatest offering tool product out there. And Zebra's apps is in my top. I do a top ten, and it's right in there, always in the top three or top four. Um, but you can create the greatest course in the world. You don't have to do instructional design. You've got to at least get a basic understanding of what web-based training is. Otherwise, you're going to have people that just totally, you know, you, I see a lot of garbage out there creating courses. And it doesn't have to be. So I, I, a little bit of response to that. I, I disagree on the instructional design part. I think you need to be an instructional designer to design effective instruction. But one thing I would add, and a lot of organizations I work with are struggling with this, which are budget and time. So when I was doing authorware back in the day, when before it was the internet, we were doing CD-ROMs, I remember a 26 module course that I had six months to create. If I have four weeks now, I'm kind of lucky. Because for one thing, like Microsoft, we, you know, part of their transformation is there's a release there's, a, there's almost always a release. When I worked at Apple, there's, there's a launch day every day. Every day is a launch day. So we have to support the velocity of business now that is moving much faster than a lot of the old models that are part of learning and development were constructed to support. And at the same time, budgets are tighter all the time. At Yahoo, we had, I was there a few years ago as a consultant, but they had, we, had, we supported half the employee base with 1.4 million a year in budget. And that was almost 8,000 employees that we had support for that. So what we see, I think part of the dark ages we're in now, L and D budgets are constrained, resources are hard to get. These rapid authoring tools are promising in the world. We've got to support businesses at speed of velocity, you know, at a velocity that's moving so much faster. All of these constraints are coming together to result in some of that slide jump you see online. And that's part of our struggle. Especially when teams are small. I have four people on, on the team. Yeah. Just to do the training or have to be played. It's a difficult challenge. It is a very difficult challenge. And um, I would like to parlay that into a, a related topic. We, we have, OK, so let me start by saying this. A couple of years ago here in San Francisco, um, the DevLearn was happening, you learning to build DevLearn. And uh, my friend Steve Howard, I told the story a couple of years ago, my friend Steve Howard had a special little pal pin made up. And when we went through the expo hall and we were talking to the vendors, I was, I was walking around with them, 
when a vendor would say something like, oh, our tool can now do drag and drop, or our tool can now do this, or our tool can do that, he would do this. And he'd just point to his little lapel pin, which had fine print on it, and they'd have to lean in to read it. And, the, and they'd read it and said, author work could do that in 1992. <laughs> 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 All right. the, the point being that it doesn't seem as if we're leagues beyond what we could do back then. We, we created just as good e-learning back then as we're doing now. In fact, in many ways, it was much better in, in, in many ways, too. Mm -hmm. Having said that, there are three big classifications of tools that I see. We have the PowerPoint add-on tools, such as Presenter, uh, Attractive Presenter, and Adobe Presenter, and Zendla Studio, and um, iSpring, and others. And then you also have the installed tools, like Storyline and Captivate, things you install in your system. And then finally, you have, you have the cloud-based tools as well, like Zebra's apps, like uh, Skeletix Interact, like, uh, what else am I thinking? Like Tora Online. Like Tora Online, and so on. Like Tora, of course, is also a, an installed product as well. All of these to say, let's start with those PowerPoint add-on tools. Is there any place for them whatsoever? You say no. You said no right away. Well, tell us why. I, I just think it encourages really bad instructional design. Yes. <laughs> by, by design, it's corrupting data. So to Craig's point, you in, there, there are things you can do with it, but again, I, I think that by its inherent design, it's not meant to expose all of the data. And that's tough to mind, and I kind of agree with that. And really, part of the limitations of it, I mean, it's, it's an easy adoption, it's just a plug, you can kind of get used to doing it quickly. I've seen some interesting uses of it where game-like artifacts and interactions are created. Um, but if you are going to, I mean, I think there are places for it, especially for performance support or awareness, product information, that kind of stuff that people could get through quickly. I Sure, I mean, I, I remember at BMC, which was a, a software company, and this is to your point where they told me to work with this particular tool. I, I mean, I was doing 400 slides, articulate, where it was so big I had to break them up to publish them. And it would be like three or four hours, of, you know, one of 700 or whatever down at the bottom, right, going through it. But that wasn't the appropriate use of that. But for a short burst of just product information for salespeople or something, or even marketing-like information, the quick and easy, you get the content from the subject matter expert, and you don't have to do a whole lot to it to get it distributed fast. You know, one thing we did at, at, when I worked at Apple, it was really hard because we weren't disclosed. Training never had information about whatever was going to happen. So we got our information from the keynote and from the marketing website. And then we had 24 hours to get training into the field for sales. Training. So we had to, you know, we'd, we'd be taking copious notes at the keynote, and we're learning about the features, and then we'd run, because the minute the keynote's over, the marketing website would change, so we'd get the specs, and then we'd have something to feel quickly. That, I mean, although we didn't use PowerPoint there, that's where that kind of tool would be really useful, because you can get something out really quick. Would you say that PowerPoint tools are easy to use compared to others? They're easy. Yeah. Well, or would you say that they're powerful compared to others? No, I think they stifle creativity because of their lack of power. They stifle creativity because of their lack of power. So uh, well, speaking to what Clark said earlier, there's a balance between power and ease of use. Before uh, Clark uh, explains what he's doodling back there, <laughs> uh, I, have, uh, I have the uh, privilege of uh, going through a wonderful uh, Captivate course that was not created by Joe. Uh, <laughs> but basically, I could not tell if it was Captivate or if it was PowerPoint. I don't think you can blame PowerPoint for people that use it poorly. PowerPoint can be a good tool, it's how you use it. Capture is a wonderful design tool for learning if you use it right. So don't blame the tool, it's the developer that PowerPoint doesn't kill people, people kill people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, Phil more or less made my point, but... Uh, the bullets that kill people. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was good. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, Clark mentioned uh, object-oriented uh, programming. So, you know, you get if you use the features of PowerPoint creatively, you get inheritance because you have master slides and you can inherit from them in, in your regular slides. If you make use of uh, hyperlinks 
invisible or 100% transparent regions to create hotspots, uh, sets of slides to create interactions that are all identical except for the part that you want to change and based on click, you can implement any interaction as long as it operates on clicks uh, in PowerPoint very easily with no programming required. That is an amazing amount of power for a very simple tool. I mean, if you want to talk about ease of use and power, it is in PowerPoint. The problem that you run into is, as Brandon said, it becomes inefficient at a certain point because the amount of slides that are required to implement these things do grow your deck to about you know, 500, 700 slides. And I mean, the memory keeps growing and the, the power of our computers keeps growing, but it's still at the point where it's kind of right on the edge of what the machine can handle. Do you, you want to know a funny it. story? I'll go quickly so I can. But I, I work at the, uh, in the interactive entertainment business at Microsoft with the Xbox team. And we actually moved away from PowerPoint to Storyline. And we, we were using Storyline in, in the classroom. So we're no longer using PowerPoint in the classroom, we're using Storyline. The funny thing is we're not using our own product, we went to Storyline for it. The point I wanted to make, you know, as you, formal learning really makes sense for, pre, for, for novices. They're the ones who don't know what they need to know. They don't know why it's important. They need the full wrapping, right? But once they start doing the task and are in the world, they know what they need. They just want it. They know why it's important. They're bloody well doing it. And that was your point, Brent. I think that you say those PowerPoint tools are great when they, people just need a little dump from a SME about how to do X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. But Sorry. as they become move off to experts, there isn't anybody who can be designing their solutions. They're the ones who know this stuff. They need other people to interact with, and we start living in a value. You know, you know, and in here we have you know coaching and mentoring and stuff. But the the point is that these people who need a much richer experience, and in, in many ways, PowerPoint does lead to a linear experience. You and I love what you said. That power, you know, I haven't really thought that through, and that's absolutely right that that's there. But I think Michelle's point is that that it's easy to take the SME's PowerPoint presentation and dump it in and add a quiz and off you go and you think you're done. Which I think was your point, you do need to understand instruction. You need to understand what a learning experience is and then you can do many tools you can do, which goes back to my point, get the design right first, there's lots of ways to do it. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention, I have a unique perspective. One is because, uh, you know, I do an analyst, a blogger thing and I, I see a lot of products, I represent consumer clients but I also represent uh, vendor clients. And I have a vendor client who does a PowerPoint add-in. Now, me personally, I, I don't, you know, it, to me it's PowerPoint. Um, I mean, that's what the point is. It's kind of stuck in there and it's simplified. And if you look at these kind of products, um, the PowerPoint add-in, you'll notice they never say courses. They always say slides. And if you look, you know, Noodle was a product that went SaaS-based. They never could figure out they're gone now they were always referred to slides. And I consider that a, a, a key component. Uh, you know, Studio, the, the whole thing about Articulate Studio is that the main product everybody uses, I mean, the, the whole point of it is Presenter. And if you look at Presenter, what do they call the terms? Slides. Um, now, you're creating it as a course. But to me, slides always refers to presentations. And so, you know the, the thing with about Studio and Articulate Studio. Now they're gonna they're changing the UI, and I'm actually in the beta group, but I can't disclose what is being seen. What the thing about Studio is, is you have a product that can only take you so far. You know, if you're an, a true instructional designer or you have some of those skill sets, then the only product that you can actually manipulate is Engage, and you can manipulate it into what we call an HTML kit. Um, the quiz maker is a highly part of you know product. I always believe uh, the video, the encode product they give you was just a throw in because nobody was buying the thing, and they just figured, hey, let me throw something in here for you. But I mean, th there is always a supply and a demand, and from the case of my vendor client, you know that's the piece is there's always going to be demand as long as PowerPoint's out there of people wanting to use this, but I still see it. Even with you add all these, and they're constantly adding capabilities. I mean, Zendler Studio is a PowerPoint add-in. Um, iSpring, um, the Pro product, is a PowerPoint add-in, and Presenter is a PowerPoint add-in. 
And, you know, Snap Plus by Latora is a PowerPoint add-in for all sake and purposes. So there is a demand there, but I think what you're going to also be seeing is that, you know, so again, another light bulb's clicked on for a variety of rapid content authoring tools, and they're adding these kind of functionalities to pull an audience. You know, it comes down to supply and demand. If there's enough of a demand, a product is going to come out. If there's no demand, then the product's going to disappear, which is what happened with Noodle. Noodle. Well, I think a lot of it's driven by when I work in an L and D that an L and D that there's two types of L and D groups. Usually, there may be one that's a cost center. So you may be a cost center where you're funded by the line of business or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and then the relationship's a little different with, with you as a business, if you will. If you're a profit center, I've been in both types of organizations. It's a little different. Like I said, we were a profit center. We did multi millions of dollars a year and selling our learning, so we were able to invest that back into trying different things, and that's why I got to do <clears throat> Second Life like I did. When you're a cost center, it's a little harder, and I think part of our problem with the rapid tools is we are, like I said earlier, we're driven by needing to get things done, and needing to get them done quickly because you've got the business always querying you as to why you're taking so much time or whatever, right? And so, or even what you're costing. And like the BMC example, you know, I came to my my director at one point, and I'm like, this is a big course, and I don't think we need this much information because it's in other courses. And he's like, no, 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 we need more content because we sell it. And if we, if they're gonna pay more money for more modules, because that's what they look at. And then on the other side, when I was looking at a startup recently, for accountants, they need so many CEU, CEU, CEUs a year to, get, to keep their CPA certification, which is based on seat time. It's just you've got to get 90 minutes or whatever. So we created more content so they would sit there longer. <laughs> so some of what we do and our tools decision is driven by what we can produce and how quickly we can produce it to support these odd business needs. This is uh, something that I've been railing against for years myself. And um, it, 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 it speaks directly to what you said earlier, too, about how we try and translate a new environment into what we already know. Uh, and I see this all the time. Yes, so we need to have these CDUs. We need to have uh, seat time, seat time. It's like, that's not the point. The point is what? The point is for the person to learn what they need to learn to make themselves more productive, to make themselves more knowledgeable, whatever the case might be. But it can't be simply to get through an hour or three or five or 15 of material. Then you're doing them a terrible disservice. And yet, it is all too easy, of course, to get into that realm. And the same holds true for all too easy for people to simply use PowerPoint because they already know it and to use an add-on tool and think, good, I'm done. If you don't know any better, you're not going to do any better. Someone else? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that another one of the criteria for maybe making a choice about an authoring tool is you know, your group. If you have a team, I can't afford to have just a few people on the team who can do maybe JavaScript and HTML5. I have to have a tool that everybody can use, even the junior members. And to speak to somebody else's point about transitioning from IoT to e-learning, we've got a lot of that going on. So you've got instructors who need to come up with speed on how do I create e-learning. So we need to have something like, I mean, we love storylines. Sorry, Michelle. No, oh, I love storylines. Yeah. I love Storyline because it, it combines both. I mean, when it came out, I was like, this is fantastic. And Lectora 11 as well has done the same thing. They've made it, you know, they've made their, their GUI, their user interface really accessible, looking like PowerPoint. But it's actually a robust tool. So it just depends on how much you can do. I used to go huge, huge courses using <laughs> Presenter. And I, I don't ever want to use it again in my life, you know? <laughs> So Storyline with Car 11, I, I don't use half a day, but I think it's great. You have to make a decision for your team, a tool that everybody can use. Because, you know, that's going to allow those junior people, maybe I've, I've designed something, I've developed it, okay, a year from now, we go back, you want to do a redesign. You, you, want, you can hand that off to a junior person, and they can still work with it. Yeah, and they can learn from you, too, because they can look at what you, what you know, the actions that we put in there. It's a struggle, on it, but we are in the dark ages because, mm -hmm. and I keep saying that, I don't know, but the reason why is your workforce is already mobile, mm -hmm. and everything you're doing should be mobile first, even if you're not delivering on mobile devices yet. 
So we're, where the corruption comes into play is when we're marrying all this content into a, a system that will only output to, a, to something that's not appropriate for mobile. So your content strategy, you should already be thinking, will this support my mobile workforce? Because they are already mobile, if you're not. They and the instructional design for mobile is so very different, is what you're saying. And I don't think that we I don't know. I'm talking about just the content. So your content strategy, what are you doing? Are you putting all of your stuff into PowerPoint, which probably isn't going to work for you when you have to start supporting different OSs or multiple you know, ways that people deliver, you know, look at things on different screens. Because that's what, in five year, five to six years, more people are going to be typing on glass than keyboards. That's how it is. If you're not already thinking mobile in your content strategy, you're behind. So I think about the push of, of information and all these tools push, push, push for people to pretty much passively take in information. And I'm thinking about I think someone up there has some social networking and instructional design skills. I mean, there's a social networking uh, marketing certificate here at the College of Extended Learning at State where you could learn more about social networking because I think there's a lot of power in pulling and pushing information from people and having them be interactive in what they're learning. And so I think these authoring tools and your company probably restricts you to having like certain policies and things that you have to uh, push out that people have to learn. But what about you know getting stuff back? And I wonder if you have any That's any comments about incorporating social networking tools into what we're doing right now. Can I can I just uh, <laughs> want to m mention uh, one thing as a product to kind of look at is. Uh, uh, utilize, it has some function, it's just like Storyline in the sense that it offers something for anybody to use as well as uh, advanced capabilities and that's the Domino Claro product um, which is SaaS based. They do the collaboration peer review, they do where you can take notes, they have the, the audit trails, you know, all those kind of things. You can output to HTML5 or Flash. Um, it does some basic analytics if you don't want to use an LMS that's, I'm not a fan of that. I'm used as it as an authoring tool. But what I think find I really like about the product is that a lot of you know the, the, when people do the collaboration, sort of the, the the downer is that you can be working in the same course, but if I want to get in, you have to get out of the course, and then I can go in and work on it. And or you can be working on the same course, but you have to be in two different areas. And what I really dig about the Claro product is you don't have to be. You can actually be working in the same um, course page as somebody else wherever they are in the world. And I, I totally agree with you is that, uh, in all due respect to, to my colleague there, is I, I think, you know, you're living in uh, the old utopian Superman world if you think you know, somebody's going to have instructional design skill sets ourselves. and everybody's going to be available for that, or e-learning development skill sets. You have to take what you can take, and in today's economy, those uh, folks are not going to be all sitting around in, uh, they get laid off. I mean, training, Everybody people get laid off. off. And so that? you're going to have to find what you can do. Now, as a benefit, I didn't come from an instructional design background whatsoever. I have a master's in, in mass comm, uh, in, uh, in marketing. I, I don't have it. But Superman what I did was I, you know, this was back in 98, I checked out a couple of books and I read it. And I was never a fan of Addy. I, they used a hybrid. The super speed that aspect. said, is I hired people that were not instructional Makes designers, but the scope you know, I taught them possible. how to build an excellent course. And so it would be great if I'm working at a huge company like Apple, like Yahoo, like Sun, um, which I see a lot of times at these present at um, conferences, and they talk about this extensive list of de you know developers and instructional designers. But if I'm in a small or mid-sized company, or heck, even some large companies I've worked at, Fortune 500, I, I don't have the the benefit. I have trainers. And then I have to have them do some some course development. And I think these products like Storyline, like uh, Claro, Zebra Zaps, and there's uh, I would say about 40 that fit in this area here, have the capability for somebody who does not have the skill sets yet for instructional design and the 
people who do and they can work uh, simultaneously on a course in some other matter and as a training director or training manager or whatever level you happen to be at at your company you if you have that instructional background or have learned it then I would say to you that you should expand that and provide that to other people that work there. If, what I've always found disheartening is that training people, learning and development people um, are adamant about providing the skill sets for the employees, for the customers. And yet us as a group do not always follow that mantra um, in enabling that. And so we come off as the experts, but why have one expert and nobody else in your team when you can have 10 experts or 10 people that have enough knowledge to do something? And, and that's my personal take when it comes to the power of authoring tools, especially with collaboration and, you know, especially, uh, specifically with SaaS space, which opens up a lot more opportunities. Thank you. So to the point on social network, I just want to touch on that quickly. Um, you know, I think, and you kind of, go a little bit to what Craig was just saying. At the end of the day, if I'm in L&D, and I'm, I'm, I'm there to support a business need or business goal, I think it's my job to be able to tell the business that you have a competent workforce that can execute against those goals. How I do that is I provide effective instruction to make sure that that competency is there. I think you have to have the skill set to know how to provide that kind of curriculum mm -hmm. and then the analysis capabilities to make sure that I can report to the business that yes, your workforce is competent. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you can't measure it, if you don't, if you don't have something measurable, then how would you Then how can you do it? Yeah. If I don't know instructional design, I'm not going to probably be able to do that effectively. And, to me, to the point, and that's why social learning and social networking isn't that important to me as an L&D professional because people inherently are going to informally get together and they're gonna socialize, that's what humans do. So I'm more interested in making sure that the workforce is competent than that they can go talk to each other on Jive or Salesforce.com. I don't really care about the social learning from that construct. I, mean, I, I want to make sure they can execute to the business goals. I'd like Michelle to, uh, to respond and then I'm gonna stop for a moment because Nick has to leave for the airport in 10 minutes, and I think uh, it'd be a good time to do the giveaway. Uh, but no one's allowed to leave the room after. <laughs> it's like, oh, I lost, I'm leaving, okay? No, we're changing the doors. Um, so I want to make a point on social networking, because you asked. And um, I hadn't seen it work until I got to Oracle. Um, but I want to we don't use it as a primary training tool. We do have Oracle Social Network, and we're implementing some new internal HR systems, for lack of a better word, that are kind of complex and changing the way we've always done things, and require a lot of training on not just the concepts behind them, but actually just how to use the software. It's a little book. And so there's, we've started to really use the Oracle Social Network as a performance support tool. It's not integral to the training. You're not required to go out there. But the conversations that are happening before, after, and around the training are very, very useful, and they do two things. They enable our participants to really discuss things and help each other, but they help us improve the training because we can see where they're really having issues because they're just talking about it, and we're basically spying. <laughs> so... <laughs> NSA. I was going to say... I, 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 we're I, analyzing. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I find it interesting that... Uh, and I'm a big fan of Storyline and a big fan of Capabase and Zebra's apps. But every tool seems to have uh, something about it that I really like that is different from other tools. Um, Zebra's apps, in their professional version, has what are called events. That's what events are. They're kind of like slides. Okay, basically, that you can navigate between. So in essence, it's really hard to get away from this concept nowadays. Since Authorware days, almost everything seems to be, in essence, slide-based, or at least uh, reminiscent of it. Nick, please. Uh, one comment I want to make is yeah. uh, we're talking about the tools, focusing the tools. I want to make sure you guys are focusing on your audience. Like whatever tool, whatever objects you're giving them, that it helps them. So make sure you're analyzing, getting feedback, seeing what makes sense. There are a couple consultants here. Um, so I mean, that's really come to the table, but that's really important. And then again, the other thing I want to encourage you is we're picking on PowerPoint stuff. If you go to um, TED.com, that's all PowerPoint or Keynote. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, look at that as great examples of design and how they're getting across that point. Uh, look at any Apple Keynote, you know, Steve Jobs there doing magic storytelling. 
Uh, also look at slideshare.net and just do a search or look at the top 10 and just click through that without anyone telling you anything you're able to understand that message or that story and that's a, that's a talent or skill that you need to learn to be, become better designers to be able to communicate and storytell and so on. Nick, before you do so, that, could, uh, can you place on the screen, uh, you, Alan, is that you or? Oh. That's cool. There's um, watchcycle.com yeah. or something else. Yeah, put your. Yeah, That's okay. okay. Yeah, I'll just tell. Okay. I'll tell story. I was going to suggest <laughs> that Craig um, has a, a great web uh, site where he talks about tools and also uh, learningsolutionsmag.com. He mentioned, for instance, Claro. I did a review of that recently. I do a review each month um, of a tool, of a different tool or an update of a tool. So you go to learningsolutionsmag.com. Clark and, and everybody at this table has written articles for that. But mine is specifically reviews, so you can search on my name and then you can look at tool reviews. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so uh, we launched a new software as a service web app uh, called launchlightbulb.com. It's a uh, team collaboration, helps you manage projects, teams, and tasks. It's free for the opening three projects. Um, you can archive projects. Um, so we're going to give away a iPad uh, Today Mini. Uh, if over the next week, okay, if you go log in, set up a free account, and you Throw a couple tasks in. We'll give away another iPad next Friday, and we'll ship it back here. Right? But you got to use it, so it's only whatever 50 people here, so you've got a good chance of winning it again. Good yeah. so. <laughs> All right. So the your winner eye? of the iPad me, I was just grabbing a card randomly. Whoa! Uh, it's a fancy one. Adam Armijo. Adam here. group that's part of it, this, this, this chapter on uh, the flipped classroom, uh, which is uh, flipping the classroom, which is apparently uh, migrating, uh, have some big successes, successes in universities, and is migrating into the corporate training world. So I wondered what y'all know about that, because you know the presenter was pointing out, and he's also doing it at North Bay uh, gig shortly, next week, I think. But that basically the learners, they come into the classroom knowing the material. Uh, and that it's measured, just like a, a teacher in a school. You know if your folks have learned the material or not, and who needs to be worked with more. And then the classroom, and, and they can get that through all kinds of media, whether that's going to be, you know, maybe reading a book, I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, uh, videos, I don't, I don't remember, but maybe, maybe some of you learning in there, but whatever. They, they, they've come in with knowing the material. Then the classroom is used for discussion and then experimentation, uh, activities, you know, really uh, you know, getting the material so they can apply it. So I just wondered, uh, and, and I, I think it sounds like a great idea. He's saying it could revolutionize things. And so how's that playing here? OK. My hand's up first. <laughs> my hand's up first. <laughs> oh, actually, Clarissa was, but you, yours was more vehement. So yeah. Was first of all, I am from North it's Bay. Like my North Bay, though, is three and a half hours north of Toronto. So I have 3,500 miles to answer this question. Uh, we are working with uh, uh, Flipcraft and moving uh, definitely that direction. I am the proud owner of about 400 videos dealing with every aspect of mobile development. I will tell you right now that when you start looking at flipped classes, don't think the entire class has to be flipped. Pick and choose what works. And when you're getting into the college and university level, as compared to the kids, like a lot of the studies have been on uh, the younger generation, the uh, K to 12, there's a lot of study on that, on how successful it is. Because then kids are doing the, home, uh, doing the study at home, parents can get involved with that, and they don't ask the parents questions like, are you smarter than a fifth grader? Some of us are not. But uh, then they can ask the teacher those questions, so there's a lot of success there. At the higher grade levels, you're going to pick and choose when you do that. And remember that uh, you have adults, you have social 
uh, lives, people are going to be distracted. How much homework are they going to do? You're, be prepared for people to come to the classroom or come and say, oh, I didn't have time, didn't get it done, my internet was down, the dog chewed the network cable. <laughs> you know? So there are drawbacks to it. Don't expect it is the miracle worker, because it is not. It is good. But pick and choose when you're going to do it, plan it out ahead so they know, and people can plan their lives around, yes, I need to go through these, uh, I have an hour and a half of video I need to get through, I have to read these things first, and then they come into the class and have planned discussion, planned activities within the class with that, proving that they've mastered that content. So again, the key thing for me was, when I first started looking at flip classes, I thought we had to flip the whole classroom, but no, pick and choose what you're going to flip. Well, I I tweeted out, and I don't know if those of you who aren't following Twitter but could be. I'm, when I can't get a word in it, but <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, I'm using Twitter as a way to respond. And one of the questions I asked was, do these rapid tools make it difficult to do improved pedagogy? It's doable, and you, you made a very clear case, but do they make it more difficult to do improved pedagogy? If you have the opportunity for blending, the chance to get the social interaction is powerful. You know, give them problems, let them work together, then facilitate the discussion. This is great. Um, and then, yes, absolutely use the tools. One of the things that I know uh, of, you know, in corporate, we may have easier than you may have it in, in higher education, and is a, a company was doing customer training. They couldn't sign up for the face-to-face -face until they had successfully completed the online courses. So you don't have this problem. Everybody's a level, and then they can come get the face-to-face, -face, and there's some you know, pressure to get the face-to-face -face done. We can have some sticks as well as carrots. And you absolutely should. And you, there's ways to use the technology in the class together to do some uh, polling responses quickly to refresh the material before you d d dive into the group activities. But now we're beginning to talk about, to me, the important issue. Again, the design, the pedagogy. How do we get people doing meaningful problem solving and then get discussion going on around it, that's where learning happens. Part learning doesn't happen from knowledge dump and knowledge test. It doesn't lead to any meaningful change. Yeah, part of my problem with the, I mean, I'm on the fence with this, I don't, because a, a couple of experiences, my, so I, I think it goes around appropriate assessment is part of my concern, if you will. And just a, a quick little anecdote, my, my kid was in uh, junior high school, no, uh, I'm sorry, she was 11th grade, she was her junior year. And uh, her al algebra was not working for her. The instructor was just not working at all. And in the state of California, they're teaching to the test. And there's just a certain, you know, it's not good, but it is what it is. So she needed, all she cared about was passing the test. That's it. She wasn't getting the effective instruction from the instructor that could lead her to that. And she found that Khan Academy website by accident and she watched the videos. And so what she did in a self-directed manner was she removed the instructor from, from her issue at all. So she no longer listened to the instructor, she didn't care. She watched the con, con videos because they're aligned to the California uh, state mm -hmm. curriculum. She watched those and she could get it and she could pass the test because that's all that mattered. And so it was great that she found the resources she needed to meet the assessment requirements that she had in front of her. That was fine. And she marginalized the instructor at the same time and didn't give her what she needed, so she self-directed. That part's great. And I think to Clark's point, in, in the class dialogue and discussion and reflection and all that is a necessary component, but I think there's something missing there in the, in the corporate world. At the end of the day, I go back to my other mantras, we have to effectively know that there's a competent workforce there, and I don't know how we do that without an appropriate mechanism for assessment. I'd like to add to that too. Uh, scenarios. Scenarios, definitely. Mm -hmm. exactly. um, and, and Craig, I'm not sure if you have something to say, but I'll, I'll look at you next if you do. Um, <clears throat> a friend of mine recently, in the same industry, recently went into an, uh, an organization where they had asked them to check out what they had done so far with e-learning. They were kind of new to it. They had um, uh, created their first course and um, and they wanted him to come in. So he asked to see it in advance, and he took a look. It took him about 17 minutes to get through the, the lesson. It was kind of PowerPoint-ish. It was pretty linear. And there were five questions on, at the end of the quiz. So we've all seen this kind of thing before. Some of us have created this kind of thing before. Um, well, when he went in to talk to them, they said that they were pretty pleased with the results of this because 
everybody had passed. Every single person had passed. And, um, and, and uh, everybody had completed the course, so they were really happy because they had done a good job. And my friend said, well, you know, you have an LMS. Let's, let's get some reports out of that LMS besides completion rate. And he asked them, um, he said, how long does it take for an average person to go through this? And they said, oh, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, he said, that's right. It took me about 17 minutes. Now, let's look at the average uh, learner, uh, the average employee, how long it took to go through this. Two and a half minutes? <laughs> Two and a half minutes it took them to get through it, OK? And they said, well, how is that possible? And he said, well, here's how. Next, next, <laughs> next, <laughs> next, <laughs> next. And they said, well, then how do they pass the test? Well, OK, they get an unlimited number of times in the test. There are five questions. Let's see how many times the average learner took the test. Six times. Okay. Why? Because all they were doing was checking out the question. Oh, I remember I got that one wrong. So A, 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 went back and remembered and went B, you know, whatever. Did they learn anything? Had they spent their money wisely? Of course not. And these are the kinds of eye-opening uh, data that you absolutely need. That you need to be able to measure not just, oh, did they complete it? But, you know, did they actually learn anything? And if so, then the whole thing had been done wrong from the beginning. They had not set up Clark mental scenarios. I am the hugest fan in the world of scenarios. I, when I teach Captivate or Storyline or Zebra Zaps or anything, I'm teaching scenario building as well. Because to me, that's the only way to really engage the learner and make the learner uh, challenge the learner and make decisions along the way. That's and you know what? And get the assessment that they can do the task. Right. And you know what? Adult, adult learners will cheat. When I did my online driving school, I Googled the answer. <laughs> People will cheat, so you have to be able to have an effective assessment instrument. If they don't know what, what the value is to them. Right. Craig, do you want to add anything to that? No. No? He's frozen. Oh. I lost the money. He can't hear you. I'm sorry, what's that? <laughs> so did you want to add anything to the discussion right now? I'm sorry, sorry it's hard for me to hear. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'm not even sure how to summarize all that at this point. Um, let, let's keep going then. I mean, the, sum, the summary is we're talking about the importance of valid tests. The importance of being able to measure learning correctly. Yeah, it started with blended learning. Yeah, well, so in the flipped classroom flipped model, classroom. and I guess yeah. can, I don't know how, one of the things we had at one of the companies I worked for recently, when I went in, because they, although it's the company that makes these little gadgets, and I won't name drop them too much, but they don't do a lot of online, and they don't use their devices in training, so it's all in the classroom, and very classroom heavy still, they don't like e-learning, because it hasn't, they haven't seen it done well, and but, but it's very activity driven. They, if, I was told early on, if there's not something happening in the first few minutes, it's a design fail. Mm -hmm. Meaning they need to get, uh, it's a Tiagi thing where you're getting up and you're moving, you're doing something, you've got the devices in your hand and you're learning about them or whatever. So although we're talking technology based stuff, there's nothing better, in my opinion, in instruction than an expert and a learner together somehow. And in the classroom right now, that's where it's happening most effectively, I think. Okay, uh, yes, young lady in the back. I would say the reason you have that happening in a classroom is you don't, as somebody brought up earlier, there is a definitive difference in how you design learning for whether it's a virtual meeting learning, an online learning, or a classroom. And there just happens to be, because of what's been around the longest, is face-to-face -face learning. Most people will know how to do that because there's a larger degree of people. However, it all goes back to that same basic premise. We have four different learning styles cognitively in people's minds. That information has to have somewhere to land. Is it either going to land in your long term, your short term, or in one ear and out the other? And when we work with people, that's the first thing I ask is, how are you informing or are you training? Are you have, are you having yeah. people learn something, or are you doing a brain dump? Right, right, right. And that's that point. scenario or that interaction, it, it is a different set right. of skills to create that in e-learning. Mm -hmm. But it's the same premise on, will you remember it? Yeah. You'll remember it without even trying. You have to put no effort into remembering content if it has somewhere to land in your brain. 
If that scenario re revolves around your school, your job, your situation that relates to you and what you're doing, you can do that in e-learning. You can probably right. do it better in e-learning. Well, one reason we moved from PowerPoint at Microsoft in this Xbox division at Microsoft to Storyline was because we wanted we we wanted in the classroom that and it's a particular audience we're training, which are customer call agents. So these are the agents on the phone that are dealing with problems all the time. So in the classroom, we do a lot of role play. So understanding how to speak to a customer, the soft skill stuff, you know, and getting together and, and talking and understanding and that kind of stuff. But then there are also activities that are really individual based and that are where you're really learning a specific uh, something about a product or something because you have to be aware of the products as well, right. combining the soft skills. So at that point, they'll move to a storyline interaction that, that's been created. And they'll probably do that in the classroom, or they can even do a lot of those on their own before or after class. So instead of using one tool to develop like the presenter's slides, the facilitator slides, or, or whatever, all of that is in the storyline application. And then the notes part, are the presenter's notes and information, and he or she can go back and forth, and then direct the students to the interactions in the storyline as well. So it's kind yeah, of like just a place to have all of the, you don't have a facilitator guide in Word or a deck in PowerPoint anymore, you just have everything in that particular tool. Well, and I think that's an important distinction that needs to be called out, because all of these tools were developed for one reason or another. To make we money. as an industry yeah. have tried to shove a square peg in a round hole with yeah. PowerPoint. It right. was designed to be a meeting presentation tool. Right. It was never designed to be an e-learning development tool. Right. We just stretched that puppy exactly. and asked Microsoft to build some more things in there. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I have to give my plug to Zebra's apps. I'm from Allen Interactions. But uh, I think the distinction that you need to think about is, am I trying to create something that is an experience, can I go into one of these tools and pull 27 slides out of PowerPoint and make one deep interactive experience on one activity instead of having someone next, 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 next to just see a slide. And frankly, the reason why a product like Zebra's apps is becoming so popular in so many ways is because Storyline, Captivate, None of these other tools can really does really have that kind of power, but I have to say, of course, with that power comes the time the time that you need to learn it as well. Mm -hmm. The basic concepts are pretty simple, but if you want to be able to do something substantial, it takes a lot less time to learn that than it takes to learn Flash. But compared to everything else, the only thing that would do, be able to do it is Flash. And but Flash doesn't give you a drop down menu to basically cheat with like Zebra does. <laughs> Editorial soapbox. The Learn Chat I'm missing to be here, it's a Twitter chat we hold on Thursday evenings, was about problem-based learning today. And the pre-reading was a meta-analysis of problem-based learning versus traditional knowledge dump. And the empirical result is that you actually do better on a knowledge test right away after the, form, after the typical learning experience. But in the long term, and for the ability to deal with challenging versions of it and ambiguous problems, problem-based learning trumps it upside down and the other. And uh, group role plays, they're challenging to solve a problem and interact with people anyway. Scenarios, you're putting people, having to apply the knowledge to solve problems. If you're not doing that, why are you bothering? Right, exactly. <laughs> Seriously. Somebody else and there is a role to get the knowledge that they need before they're prepared to do that. Although I like also putting the problem in the center and having those resources ready when they suddenly understand why it's bloody well important. But if you're not doing Are, it, are you British? I mean, I'm hearing sad and bloody. I spent seven years in Australia. I got contaminated. <laughs> <laughs> Measuring training, etc., and I would just be interested to hear what the panel has to say about designing e-learning for highly regulated industries, where the training is, you know, like recorded, like the biotech, the pharmaceutical, the banking industries. If you have any suggestions or comments on e-learning tools or design e-learning, you know, in the future over the next one to five years for such industries. Go ahead. Okay. 
Uh, one of the things that um, I'm working on, and I actually uh, did a paper on this, is uh, something called confidence-based learning, where uh, you're going through, you're going to answer a question, um, and then uh, when you have your answer, you're then asked, how sure are you of that? Are you 100% sure? You get high risk, high reward. And if you say, well, I this is the answer, but I'm not quite sure, so it's a low risk, low reward. Or if you say, I have no idea, I'm just guessing, you get no marks at all. And what you do is you track how many marks you get, you also track the demerit points. And so you may have a high score, but if you have some demerit points with you, then you haven't learned that material. And in some of the, uh, the uh, papers and the research done on confidence-based learning, they were looking at nurses especially, because when a new nurse goes on the floor, who's training that new nurse? It's the older nurse, the people with the experience. Those nurses with the experience training the new nurses were averaging about 70 to 75% accuracy on health tests. Mm -hmm. And they're now training the new nurses. That was an issue. We had nurses that were basically gonna be killing patients. So what happened is they do confidence-based learning, and all of a sudden their knowledge and their, the transfer of the knowledge and their understanding based on the confidence-based learning, that when they knew how they were being tested, they knew the risk and the reward, all of a sudden that retention went way up and they're up as high as 95% uh, in uh, their testing afterward. And the whole shift on how confident and, and how good that information transferred and how much they retained went way up because of confidence-based testing. So I'm a big fan of that. and. Uh, it's a new feature that we're actually introduced to our uh, mobile apps program uh, this coming year. We'll do a lot more of that. I would so, also suggest uh, that well, one quick thing, that uh, you check out Skilletix Interact. Uh, it's a tool out of New Zealand that has just opened up their offices here, and that's all they're about is creating uh, scenarios um, for, uh, and it's used widely in regulation, regu regulatory types of uh, organizations as Can well. you repeat that again? It's called Skilitix, S-K-I-L-I-T-I-X. S-K-I-L-I-T-I-X. And uh, that's the name of the company, and the product name is Interact. Is it coupling that with item response theory to validate how confident they are that they're done? Yes, in fact, different type yeah. of confidence. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, no, in fact, uh, it has all sorts of features built in so that if you are answering a question, you can ask them to justify their answer, and they have to. They can. There's a confidence level. There, there. You can set up your own gauges for uh, being able to ascertain how well they're doing. It also allows you to do things like have wrong answers disappear over time. Um, and, and of course, lessening their score, you know, all sorts of really fun things built into it. Not fun, but very instruction sound types of elements. So There's also a startup called Newton with a K. A -E K N E W T O N. And they're, they've gotten quite a bit of funding lately. And what they're doing is working towards what they're calling, and I've heard this term before, but they're, they're working on what they think they have the algorithm. But it's a startup that thinks they have it. And it's a, about personal adaptive learning. So their whole model is this hyper personalized uh, system that will, and, and actually some of it goes on now. If you take any online uh, calculus classes or, or more advanced math classes, you'll have a system that will take you through certain things and then what, you know, to kind of track your responses and then start adapting content to you based on your responses. Well, Newton thinks they have the answer to that, and they're creating a platform. They're not going to create content. They're going to create a platform that universities and corporations can buy, and then like for 200K, 300K, and then install that platform into your learning infrastructure to provide your constituents a more personalized and adaptive learning system. So you'll be creating content in a new way as an instructional designer, because you'll be creating content more agnostic to a formatting system and it'll go into this infrastructure, and then the infrastructure will determine, well, you know, Joe already knows a lot about Captivate. What can I, you know, he's answered a couple of these, these questions I've had straight up, so I'm gonna take him over here and give him this kind of content that's much more advanced. It's not gonna waste time. Adaptive learning is. Yep. Can I? Uh, yes, please. Let's jump in here and take Great. Um, you know, there's actually, I would say, three or four points here. One is, um, you know, we, we've re relied so heavy on instructor-led, and yet if you look at the, you know, if you compare instructor-led to web-based, everything leans towards web-based. 
it is as equal if not superior to instructor led if you look at data that is being compiled currently at the educational higher ed level what they're finding is even presidents and head administrators at the universities are saying that is is equal if not better WBT than ILT from a comp uh, comprehension and retention rate and yet we still are heavily sort of in this this blended learning approach as you, you know you stated you had sort of this initial classroom and then the facilitator blah 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 and then you had sort of this other kind of, of e-learning component and I think we forget the number one mantra that we're taught about adult learners what's in it for me and we rely too heavily on assessments uh, people get scared when they hear assessment you could tell them 75 zillion times it's not going to affect their job and some people just freeze up just as some people freeze up when they take an SAT uh, I've always been a big believer of scenario based learning I, I was doing it in the, in the early 90s it, it, it could be applicable today and it can do all the things that sort of you were mentioning uh, you know the panel was mentioning in terms of building up skill sets and all you do is each little module if you're taking it as a web-based asynchronous based course then you have individual modules that last maybe five to ten minutes from an intention standpoint and at the end you have a scenario and the scenario is based on all the information they just, they just learned and then you build it upon that <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, what's that? We sorry, you said at the end, and then you, get, you cut out. <laughs> um, well, at, at the end of it, they can build upon the next scenario going in, so they can bounce into the different modules, and in the final module, it's just a, um, scenarios built on the previous scenarios. So now they have to build upon their retention and comprehension, because the most effective training whether it's Ellie, you know, use the term learning and development. The most if all right, never mind. Right? We 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 lost you. We lost you part way through that. We figure that Google Hangout is something that's just making us hang on. Um, on the, we're being left hanging on the, on the best. I would just say you could build you upon build different, different scenarios, scenario based oh, learning. Wow. Yeah. All right. I give up. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what, we have about 10 minutes left, not even, not even 10 minutes. There were some questions asked in advance, Alan. Were any of them? Um, there were, there were there were a couple that came to came came from um, and I, I think one of these hangs off something that uh, the brand was talking about. Um, so one of the questions that uh, came out, came in was what do you think the competencies are for the e-learning developer coming forward? Uh, Craig, we, we lost you again part way, so we we, we figured we'd, we'd move on to the next one because hangout isn't just hanging for us. That's fine. I'll just stare here. <laughs> Part of the struggle with that, like I said earlier, was all of these, like, I've read some of these job descriptions and it blows my mind. I, I firmly believe in high resolution when you can afford it. And by that, I mean the best, the best artifacts that you can create. So I, I really believe in deep craft knowledge in particular areas. If I need really good video, I'm going to go get someone who is a videographer who understands that domain and has been there for a while. If I need a 3D animation, blah, blah, blah. That's not always a luxury we have, but I think that at the end of the day, you know, a lot of these tools, like Storyline, when I got, I was following Storyline through the beta, and it, it, I think it's a combination of great user interface design, I think it's a combination of great programming on the back end because it's, it's uh, zippy, it moves really quickly, it's kind of easy to get going. I don't read manuals, I don't take tutorials, I just dig in, and I was able to produce something pretty quickly. But I, I am not a graphic artist and I'm not a programmer, and that's where I get stuck. I'm a writer, I can put the words together, I can design the interactions, but I need other people to do these other things, because I don't believe in Clippy and bringing clip art in and, and all of that. I really want to do the best resolution I can do. I would argue, if I was in an L&D operation, 
to either vendor the proper resources or to hire those resources in so that you can do diligence to your audiences and not just produce crappy slide jump for them. Otherwise, to your point earlier, Joe Quine or Clark, why bother? So I think the skill sets are, are difficult. I really believe you do have to understand how adults learn. You have to have that theory. You don't necessarily have to get into a formal program, but you need to understand effective instructional design so that you can put it together appropriately. And you need to bring the deep craft skills in where appropriate and rely on those, those people to give you the resolution. I also think, I'll be quick, I'm just saying. No, I'm from. <laughs> I also think, to your point, that there are some powerful tools out there, like Lector 11 being challenged by Storyline became a much better tool than it has been in the past. And I'm a little partial because I, was, I helped develop the original Lectora 10 years ago. Um, so I'm pretty happy to see them coming back like that. But I think Storyline and Lectora are both really, they're powerful tools and you can, they accommodate a range of skills. So you can go in and be very easy or you can go in with a lot of advanced actions and almost get to a whole programming language. But they'll let you kind of build your your tool, skill set, and abilities. And I think that's great that the whole key behind it all is you have to be a good instructional designer and understand how it all works to even use the tool effectively. The uh, point that I, I had was uh, uh, many of you have probably have heard that uh, the average person in their career is going to have uh, 10 to 12 jobs and you can kind of bounce around. So there's a new economy coming in place and in place into what Brandon was saying earlier about uh, picking up the good people as you need it. What we're hearing now is that you're actually gonna have 200 to 300 projects in your career at top jobs. So as you need a good designer, you bring that person in. As you need a graphic artist, you bring that person in. The full-time job as we know it, with benefits and all that, is disappearing. And now it's, okay, I work for me, and I'm good at this, we can set up a hub of uh, talented people, and we bring projects in and out. And we're actually right now setting up that kind of innovation uh, within our college system, where you need something done, I've got some people that can do it. And we're just feeding people out, building things as people need it. And it's done fast, it's done quick, it's done by well-trained people, and we have the expertise in-house. And that's the 200 to 300 projects we're gonna be running through our college system. I thought we had a week before. Yes. Um, so, mobile devices have a lot of features that desktop devices don't have. They have GPS, they have cameras, they have gyroscopes. It, it, are there any tools, e-learning tools, that give me easy access to these things? So yes. Can you just oh. talk about it? <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a... Uh, if you look at, if you want to look at some really quick tools, uh, I would suggest uh, getting to uh, looking at the jQuery and HTML5. And Dreamweaver is married very tightly to it, the new version of Dreamweaver. Uh, jQuery has a new release out of 1.3, and it's all just, you can incorporate gesture-based uh, swipes, and you can build a, as a web-based app, but it looks like a native phone app. And it works on Android, of course, any phone. Yeah. Really. Isn't it for it's, using one of the wrapping technologies? No. No. Yes. Another thing to so look are at ten. is look at Adobe's Creative Cloud because they have Edge and Muse and they have some yeah. other tools that are specific to devices or definitely specific to prototyping for devices. Mm -hmm. So and I think you can, it's 50 bucks a month to get Creative Cloud going mm -hmm. or 30 bucks a month if you already own an Adobe product. And I'm not affiliated with them, but <laughs> I just love that software distribution method. But you can go look at the apps they have available. And they actually have a lot of apps on the devices themselves. They have some Android specific and some iPad specific Ooh. apps where you can create content as well. Uh, Adobe also has a large catalog out there that, of virtual um, devices that you can actually test your, your mobile learning on. You can see it on a billion different phones that they have little uh, simulations of. It's called Ooh. Device Central. Thank you. App, I think, is another one. These yeah. are tools that you you develop in HTML5, but then they've got hooks into the hardware, so the camera, the, uh, the GPS, accelerometers. Um, but I don't know about any specific 
Yeah. So you're saying I some do. of the e-learning tools the Adobe's created? Well, Adobe bought PhoneGap. So yeah, they bought the oh, PhoneGap. Okay. I will say about Titanium and PhoneGap, uh, wonderful, very quick. If you're a web developer, you want to get into that space making native apps, good. But you're going to have a hit on performance, and you're also going to uh, only work with static HTML pages. You don't work with dynamic content. We're getting the time is up uh, signal, and uh, they're really serious about this. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll stop now. Let's give a round to our... Thank you to all of you. So, round of applause to them. Well, thank you all again. Um, it's been fabulous. Um, I'm looking forward to, to the conversation continuing uh, on Twitter uh, in the LinkedIn group. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and we're, we're so proud to, to have had you here. And um, I'll see, see the rest of you at uh, various other things in the summer of your life. Uh, space is September. The space is available to, on, on Joe's session.